set out if you want, Daddy. Excellent. Whatever works. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the New Orleans Jazz Museum. My name is Matt Hampsey. I'm a park ranger for the New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park. New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park is the only national park in the world that is dedicated to an original musical art form. And of course, that's jazz music. And we are so pleased to be having this long-term partnership with the New Orleans Jazz Museum, which dates back uh, to around 2011, National Park Service and uh, Louisiana State Museum teamed up to uh, create this space and this recording facility. And one of our favorite programs that we do every month is called Talking Jazz with Fred Cass. And so uh, this is the venerable voice of, of uh, Saturday Night Jazz or Friday Night Jazz, but uh, I, I listen to it every weekend, WWNO. And i um, very thrilled today to have Ricardo Pascal, whom I took to see at the uh, Ponce Train Hotel for my wife's birthday last week. Oh. And it had Nick Payton on piano and um, uh, Jameson Ross on drums, and, and, and you were killing it. It was uh, so that was that was so much fun. And and then Ryan Hansler on piano. So please join me in welcoming Talking Jazz with Fred Cast. Thank you very much, Matt, and thank you all for being with us on this uh, beautiful San Diego summer day in December in New Orleans. And. Um, in time to hear a, a wonderful duo. These guys are not just brought together for our event this afternoon, though uh, that would certainly be laudable if we could arrange that, but they actually work as a duo on occasion, and uh, we want to celebrate that with their music and let them cut loose on a tune or two to get going right now. So please welcome to the bandstand, Mr. Ricardo Pascal on the tenor saxophone and Mr. Ryan Hansler at the piano. Thank you. 
Ricardo Pascal, Ryan Hansler, ladies and gentlemen. Those were uh, both Monk tunes? Uh, what titles? I, could, I couldn't name either one, I'm ashamed to say. That first one's coming in the Hudson, right? I no, the first one is uh, Thelonious. Oh, Thelonious. Right, no, I mean, that's yeah. right, the second one. Yeah. And coming on the Hudson? Yeah, next. right. And then the right. second one was uh, uh, Gallop's Gallop. Yeah. Which oh Monk yeah, only yeah, yeah. Recorded yeah. once, so. Yeah, I remember. I, uh, Five I, have, it, right? yeah, I can't believe I couldn't. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> couldn't <laughs> recognize it. But uh, nice to hear in that duo form. It uh, really opens up. Uh, yeah. Lots of possibilities for you guys. Monk was a, a, a well-known stride pianist and, and did a lot of solo albums. So, if you listen to his music, it kind of lends itself to that because he was very comfortable in that realm. In that realm, yeah. yeah. Uh, Ryan, you're you're from. Uh, Lowell, Mass. Originally grew up in the Boston area, mostly. Yeah, and until I was like 17 and left, and yeah. went to New York and North Carolina and Europe and here. And There's a was a bit of a uh, piano playing, uh, not professionally necessarily, uh, but piano playing tradition in your your family. A little bit, yeah. Um, my dad played, but not professionally. But my grandfather did play professionally um, until World War II, and then he was in a POW, and after that, he didn't play. It was semi-professional after that, right. so. But you you heard some uh, piano performance from your grandfather as a as a tiny kid. Oh yeah, when I was a kid, I mean, there was the records were all over the house. I mean, Gene Harris, Ray Brown, um, Miles Stravinsky, Oscar. I mean, that stuff was just like what I grew up on. WC, um, and then uh, yeah, my dad would you know growing up in Boston, my dad would uh, uh, sneak me into all the jazz clubs, even though I was you know eight nine years old. I, I remember seeing. Ahmad Jamal so many times by the time I was 12. I remember saying to him once when he told me he had tickets to see Ahmad again, I was like, Dad, is there anyone else we can see? <laughs> and I said the same thing about McCoy, too, because I was yeah. so fortunate to see McCoy so many times. Oh, wow. I saw Ahmad so many times, guys like Benny Green. Um, it was just, you know, yeah, I was exposed to a lot of good stuff. Well, you were exposed uh, to the percussive side of the piano then very early. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I feel like sometimes I'm supposed to be a drummer, not a pianist. But, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, what about the piano? Was that your, your, your first instrument? It was what we had at the house, and, and my grandfather having played it, um, you know, it was kind of a... My family want, really wanted me to keep playing it as well, and I always, it was always there, so it was just the most accessible instrument, even though the drums are actually arguably the most accessible because they're everywhere. Right. Right. Drum. You know. Pots and pans, right? Right, yeah, yeah. So it was it was an, it was an important part of the family. Oh. Did you get some lessons, or were you kind of kid that just uh, started figuring no, no, stuff no. out um, on your own? I mean, my dad signed me up with a classical teacher, and then I mean, I remember him waking me up at five thirty every day when I was like seven years old to practice for a, like half hour, forty five minutes before school. You know, when you're seven years old and you're waking up at five thirty to sit and practice your dad. Oh God. <laughs> So, um, and then uh, that lasted until I was like 13, 12, or something like that. And then I studied with this uh, a pretty well known teacher at New England Conservatory until I went off to college. So, and then, you know, in the midst of all that, I'd, my dad would be taking me to sessions and stuff. Right. So, so Charlie Benakis? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, yep. a, was a teacher. Yeah. A, a legendary. <laughs> he uh, was. I remember, as a matter of fact, I remember um, he, was, he worked with Danilio Perez and Joey Calderazzo. And uh, it was an interesting connection because Joey Calderazzo was my teacher later on in life. But I met him when I was like 12 because him and, and Charlie had some dealing with money that someone, one of the two owed each other. Oh, the other one. Something. <laughs> and so I remember telling Charlie, yeah, yeah, man, my dad and I are going to see Joey tonight. Joey Calderazzo, for those of you who don't know, is Branford Marcellus' pianist for since the passing of Kenny Kirkland. So for 22, 23 years now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember telling Charlie, yeah, I'm going to go see uh, Joey tonight. He goes, oh, man, okay, I got a, I got a note. You gotta, can you give him this note? Goes, yeah. You know, that, at 12 years old, I'm kind of starstruck. <laughs> and so uh, it's Patatucci's on bass. And the two of them kind of look similar. He has of a 12-year-old. They both had curly hair and, you know. So I remember going up to Pat John Patatucci. He's a bass player. I remember going up to him first with the note. <laughs> and said, Mr. Calderazzo? He said, no, no, that's not me. <laughs> Mr. Joey. And then, okay. So I waited, and another guy came up with curly hair. Oh, this must be Joey. So I went up to Joey, and Joey comes and sits down at the table with my dad and I and writes some crazy note back to my teacher. And, you know, <laughs> just like, 
this is just amazing that that was the world I got to live in as a kid, you know, yeah. 12 years old, getting to meet these guys. And then turned out that he was my teacher later on in life. Down at, uh, uh, at North Carolina North, Central. North Carolina Central University. Yep. Uh, yeah. But b before that, there was um, a degree up in uh, way upstate New upstate York. Upstate New York, Crane School of Music. Yeah. And uh, that, you know, it was kind of almost, kind of almost just passing time up there. I really wasn't really grounded in what I wanted to do. You know, I, I was just like, man, how could I ever really make it in music? And, and so I was also studying engineering at the same time. And music was going to be the backup. But in the end, that's not what happened. I think your partner also studied computer science as uh, his backup yeah. plan. Yeah. But he, I think he was more successful than me because I got the differential <laughs> equations. <and stuff>. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end of that. that was the bit. Of and then yeah. I got into Somewhere finance. Somewhat of a roadblock there. Right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the deterrent. That, yeah. that kind of. Did Joy remember you from 12? He, I, he did. He did. He goes, that was you? Yeah. Benny Green, too. I remember meeting him as a kid. And then I bump into him like later on. And he was like, yeah. he remembered me. It was, you know. Must have been Amazing. a good note. <laughs> 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 Who knows? But uh, um, I, I wanted to, uh, I want to come back and talk a little bit more about your experience at um, North Carolina Yeah. Uh, in, in a minute. But I want to talk uh, uh, for a minute here to our <laughs> other partner here, uh, Mr. Ricardo Pascal, who's actually uh, born in Croydon, England. Yes, indeed. That's uh, part of the metro London area, right? South London. South side. And you were there till you were six, seven years old? Until I was five. Five. Otherwise, I'd have that sweet accent right now. Got out just before sure. you got the got benefit out just of in the, time, I guess. <laughs> the all-star accent, right? Yes. <laughs> well, was uh, even at uh, your, your brief time there in, 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 uh, in the London area, was music on your radar at all before you moved to, you moved to Florida directly from? Uh, Pretty much. We went to Spain briefly. And that's why my name's Ricardo, oh. actually. I was supposed to be Jose, but they were worried that English speakers would pronounce it Josie. Josie. <laughs> which is kind Jose. of a girl's name, so <laughs> yeah. they went with Ricardo instead. Yeah. You know. And, and uh, uh, we yeah. were there for a very short amount of time before moving to Florida. Uh -huh. Yeah. What, but uh, back to, uh, were you getting interested at all in oh, music? Oh, yeah, it was, already, it was definitely already happening because my parents tell me all the time that I, I would be like, it, whatever is like on the radio, I'd just be just singing it back, <laughs> you know? Like I'd be like, what we call kind of transcribing, but uh -huh. with my voice as a kid, just whatever song was on there that I liked. And that uh, it would just be like all kinds of music, all kinds of songs, and they duly noted that at an early age. Yeah, well, uh, London has, uh, you know, I mean, a, a very diverse uh, culture, yeah, cultural yeah. Uh, inputs. You could hear a lot of different things. Oh yeah, and, and my dad uh, was a musician as well. Uh, what, there what's, in his London. what's his instrument? He played guitar, still plays guitar. And um, he played with the Foundations and Eddie Grant, oh. Frontline Orchestra, so oh. you know, mm -hmm. Build Me Up Buttercup and you know, Electric Avenue, all that kind of, those kind of songs. Yeah. That was his era though, like that was his music and he was playing with those bands. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was your first instrument? Um, I guess technically piano. But it would be like no technique, one finger, you know. <laughs> Picking out a <laughs> little melody. Yeah, you know, like, you know, <laughs> playing chords like this. <laughs> Do you have a and, keyboard at home? Is oh, yeah, the little, the little kid keyboard, you know, yeah. yeah. And uh, so that was the first one that I would, you know, but like kind of playfully like learning. And I kind of learned my first like little bits about music in terms of, I didn't know what they were called, but major, minor, diminished, Augmented, I learned all that stuff um, on the little kitty piano <laughs> uh -huh. while watching movies or playing video games. <laughs> I would press the pause button, I'm like, that's a cool song, and I would sit there and learn it. <laughs> and so that was like actually my first foray into like learning music, was learning video game music. So that's always like a part of me, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so saxophone came like maybe like a few years later in middle school. Yeah. What, yeah. Uh, what drew you to the sax? Well, it looks cool. still think this. <laughs> uh, and it was on, on, they had, so it was the coolest looking one. And on the, the table that they had all the instruments, this was the lowest one they had. I wanted to play the low, cool looking instrument. Uh -huh. And so maybe if there was a berry saxophone up there, I'd be a berry saxophonist today. But hey, that's how fate works. Huh? So. 
But yeah. I, I love the tenor sax, so it kind of worked out. I think I've had op- other opportunities to learn other instruments, and I always come back to this. You know. Did you like it pretty well uh, right away? Yes, I did, even though it was too big for me. Uh. I was a little 10-year-old, you know. It was like more than half my size, you know. So <laughs> my parents were wondering how, <laughs> how I'm going to hold it up, you know. <laughs> so, But it, uh, I grew into it, literally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, uh, the uh, uh, opportunity to play at that age, was it just school stuff, or did you start getting some private lessons, too? Uh, I didn't do private lessons till college. Um, I was uh, in band in uh, middle school. Uh, started the jazz band, the big band, in seventh grade, my second year. And in high school, I hardly did any jazz, which was kind of weird. All my jazz opportunities were like all state. Uh, not all state, like all county things, you know, uh, and that. But that would be enough. It was enough to whet my appetite and get the curiosity going and get me like playing with Abrasols, which are these backing tracks that you can solo over and play melodies over. Right. It was enough to get the 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 appetite wet and ready to go. And also, I got to play with some incredible people somehow, like Maynard Ferguson <laughs> came to town. Randy Brecker wow. <laughs> came to town and for these all county things, and so I got to play their music and stuff early on. Uh-huh. And um, so there was like, there's that that was like, get, it was getting in there, yeah. you know. What about singing, Ricardo? I, I know you you like you're a vocalist. Uh, you do a lot of singing. Background yeah. vocals, background vocals. Don't ask me to sing solo. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I have a group with uh, Grayson Brokamp, another great bass player in town, and he's. Um, uh, he is great. He is great. And uh, we have like this kind of band vocal choir combo group, basically, where everyone plays an instrument, but everyone sings as well. And so we kind of, and we both uh, love singing and like love harmonizing. And so we get to do that in that group. And, and like I said, I was in chorus in high school. So it's kind of the continuation of that. Yeah, as you know? well. And then I did a little bit in college, but then that slowly gave way to this yeah. very quickly. Any uh, pop music bands? You have a, a garage band or anything you, you, you played in as a high schooler? No. No garage band, no. no. I would go and we'd go and like jam, have jam yeah. sessions at my dad's friend's house who also played guitar, ah. you know? And ah. so it would be a lot of E major because they're both, they're both <laughs> oh, yeah, guitar yeah. players. Those you know? guitar keys, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. the, uh, and this was in uh, Kissimmee? Yeah. Central Florida. Yeah. Yeah. What uh, do you remember much about uh, uh, how th- how that uh, cultural ch- change uh, Im- impacted you as a six year old? Say no. <laughs> Did it seem like just another another place where your family lived? Yep. Because <laughs> we would go back and forth uh-huh. after a certain amount of time, and so it just became like it was just British and American. You know, it just became that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, uh, you went on to study then uh, music at FSU. Yeah. Uh, was there a point, well, prior to that, that you came to the conclusion that that was something you really wanted to pursue, or did that uh, evolve later as you began to uh, go to, through the college experience? Well, so like I said, video game music is like a big part of me. But when I realized that I wanted to study music was when I first heard Thelonious Monk. Actually, specifically when I first played a Monk tune, which was around midnight in big band. Like it was this big band arrangement. I don't remember who arranged it or anything. But the core song is all that matters, really, in that case. And it was so mysterious to me. I'm like, what is that? Like, what is that? I have no clue what that is. And I want to know badly what that is. And that started in middle school. And uh, it just kept building until my senior year of college, I think, and like, yeah, I, I was thinking, I like astronomy. Do I want to do astronomy? No, I want to learn more about this, what this thing is, this jazz, this music, swing. Like, I want to know what it is. So that started, it was really intense my senior year. I was, like, actually practicing. Didn't know what I was doing. I was just kind of playing along with things. Right. And um, I I entered this competition, uh, and all the kids from the art school were there. Because there was the art school, Osceola Arts. Right. And so we were all, they were all playing, and the guy, uh, 
there was a guy on bass who was amazing and had a band and you know like an actual trio with him. And then I got on stage with my play along, <laughs> and somehow won. I don't know. I still don't know exactly. <laughs> it was that rhythm section. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the rhythm section was killing. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so high school it really was getting. I was just getting yeah. very curious about everything, and then so finally, I'm like, yeah, definitely want to do this. My choir director. Not my band director right. told me, hey, FSU, very good school of music there. Right. Give it a consideration. And so that's where I went. The um, um, Monk, uh, who was it first turned you on? Who played? How did you come, come across uh, Around Midnight? Our uh, big band director. Oh, Dave, just, just in that yeah, arrangement. Dave, at uh, David Steyer. He uh, just had a, he had a chart, yeah. and we busted it out yeah. <laughs> and played it. And just in rehearsal, I just remember thinking, like, this is beautiful. Like, what is this? Even like, before you totally heard mysterious. Monk or anybody else play it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, um, yeah, it was later on with Marcus Roberts at Florida State University that my next level of appreciation of Monk's music yeah. particularly came through. Yeah. Because uh, he taught, he teaches at FSU. Marcus Roberts is a piano player who's arguably like Winton, one of Winton Marcellus' favorite piano players that he played with arguably late. The best. And arguably one of the best alive yeah. too, as Ryan will attest as he's transcribed Marcus Roberts. So you know how difficult that is. And just hanging with him for a bit. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And yeah. so, and he's kind of like uh, one of the most, uh, I'd say, monk influenced modern piano players around. So he really, yeah. my appreciation of, appreciation of a monk really was uh, well, that's a, a passion, elevated by him. A passion you guys obviously share. Yes. And, yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, when I met him, it was like, what the heck? This is the only guy I've heard play like this, you know? Yeah, <laughs> like I that percussive, that, yeah. like, right. yeah, Marcus Roberts, independent limbs, uh, stride right. piano, like all of that, plus the harmonic language. We were, I at, like, a, I remember we were at a gig, and you were like, I was, I was playing some Marcus thing. We didn't even really know each other that well. And you came up, and you were like, what you know about Marcus Roberts? You just you were shocked. Yeah. You just, no one's dealing with this. Yeah, yeah. Nobody, nobody. The funny thing is, I was never really into Monk until just several years ago. When I was a kid, it, Gene Harris and Ray Brown were two of my favorite musicians. I remember just putting on tapes on the weekend, right. the cassette tapes, for like two, three, four hours at a time, and I would just sit there and try to groove the way they did. All I wanted to do was swing as hard as they were. It, Monk was until like I don't know. Eight eight years ago, nine years ago, something like that, that I really started to take to him, and I realized how much I liked Monk because of how much I liked Kenny Kirkland, uh -huh. and that's what made me real. Oh, wait a minute, Kenny's getting his stuff from Monk. You know? Yeah, well, the the architecture that Monk created is just one of the greatest, most elegant things in in music. You can't deal Truly. with with this music without dealing with Monk, and Monk's music permeates so many avenues of Black American music. I mean, if you talk about hip hop. Yeah. So much of hip hop came from Monk, you know. It's yeah. It's uh, well, a lot of a lot of influences. Let's uh, let's hear some more music, Monk or otherwise. What what y'all got for yeah. us next? We don't just play Monk, by the way. Just, yeah. I know we're talking about Monk a lot, <laughs> but uh, yeah, they they've got a lot of a lot of things in their bag. Uh, what what's next, guys? Uh, some some Ellington. Once again, Ryan Hansler, Ricardo Pascal. Speaking of, uh, since we brought up Joey Calderazzo and Bramford Marcellus, um, we're going to play a composition. I think Bramford wrote this one. Bramford or Joey? We don't, we're not sure. We're going to figure it out. i got to ask Bramford. Um, title One Way.
Do one more. Do one more before we break. No, we got no. I mean, before we talk again, yeah, we got plenty of time. We're going to take it back to Monk. But with the winter, Marcellus came for us. Thank <laughs> you. 
Ladies and gentlemen, Ricardo Pascal, our tenor saxophonist. At the piano, Mr. Ryan Hansler, making this music come alive today in a beautiful kind of way. Wow, so much fun, guys. Uh, both of these gentlemen have uh, interesting connections to New Orleans through places they studied music. Uh, in Ryan's case, Ryan, I, I think you said you, you uh, worked on a cruise ship right out of under, uh, graduate, uh, undergraduate I, I school. I did, I forgot about that. And uh, a lot of people try to forget about <laughs> <Yeah>. those cruise <laughs> yeah, ship jobs. True. Dark times. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, someone there, you know, a colleague there, kind of pointed you to uh, Raleigh and... Yeah, it's someone I met there. Man, you remember more about my life than I... I forgot about this stuff. You're right. That's the purpose <laughs> yep. of these interviews. Right, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, when I, I... Right out of undergrad, that's right, I played on Carnival Cruise Lines and, and the, had a little jazz orchestra on there. and I did that for a few months and I absolutely hated it. It's a pretty miserable culture. <laughs> so being on a boat, too, is just not my thing. Yeah. Just, you know, you're stuck. Can't go anywhere. So I got off of that after like eight months, and, and someone had pointed me towards uh, North Carolina, and uh, knew some people there, and, and so I went there and uh, trying to figure out what the heck to do. And uh, I was going to go to grad school, and then uh, someone let me know about North Carolina Central University. Um, it's a HBCU that's like in, it's in Durham, smack dab in the middle of the state. And uh, teaching there was Brantford Marcellus and Joey Calderazzo. And, and then the faculty there was, were just like, man, just phenomenal. A lot of like former Batesy Big Band members. And it was a great program. And in the, in the community and the culture around the music was just like, I mean, they were really dealing with the music on a high level and knew how to play and how to teach. And it wasn't your traditional uh, academic setting in terms of jazz, which is like, we're going to feed you a bunch of patterns and licks. Right. right. And, you know. It wasn't that. It was, uh, we're going to teach you how to swing. And so I went there, and, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it worked wonders on me. Uh, Bramford uh, kind of took a liking to me, and, and Joey couldn't make a few gigs, so Bramford called one day. I got an email from his manager one day saying, uh, uh, saying hey, um, you know, could you make these dates with the quartet and, and whatever city it was? Can I? <laughs> and it, this was like four months in advance, and I remember just spending four months in a constant state of anxiety. <laughs> 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 Practicing endlessly. Get to the gig. Still screwed up the gig, because I remember, uh, I remember asking Bramford, hey, man, where are the charts for the gig? He goes, I don't know. Ask Joey. I said, Joey, Bramford says you get the charts for the gig. Where are the charts? Man, I don't know. Ask Bramford. Said, Bramford, Joey says that you have the chart. Man, there's no charts. Just go check out the records. <laughs> Okay, so I'm listening to, you know, we use all these, uh, I can't play it anymore, but all these weird asymmetrical songs with mixed meters and stuff, so I, I memorize half the stuff. We get to the gig, he only calls one of them. It's the only <laughs> tune I, that I do all right on. The rest of the time, the best analogy I can make, it's almost like if you're surfing and you see like a giant wave coming at you, and you really have two choices. Like when you're playing with this band, you can, you can get on the surfboard and just say, okay, I'm going to just go for it. Or you can pause for just one moment, and then it's too late, and you get run over. <laughs> I did the latter. <laughs> and uh, so, but then fortunately, there was more gigs down the road, and right. uh, you know, and it really, I grew so much and learned just an immense amount about this music that we deal with. And then, uh, yeah, and that, that lasted for a while, and eventually I moved to, to Europe after that. And that's how I met Ricardo, which that's is weird. It is. We, so I moved to Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, I don't know, seven years ago, eight years ago, and uh, when I was there, I, I've been. I, for those of you that don't know uh, the New Orleans Jazz Orchestra, it's, it's run by a uh, fantastic drummer and director Adonis Rose. Um, I mean, our good friends. We go back many years now at this point, and uh, we knew each other. He knew I was living in Amsterdam. You actually played together in Carolina, some. Yeah, yeah, we Adonis. did. That's how we got hooked up, like yeah. back in like oh six or seven. And uh, he knew I was in Amsterdam, and he, they needed a sub with the Normal Jazz Orchestra f for a gig with them and Didi Bridgewater in Sardinia. And uh, their pianist couldn't make it. And, you know, when, you, when you're in the, in the EU already, it's like a 75-year-old flight at the time, anyways, to get from one country to the next. So they flew me over there because it was cheap. 
and I met Ricardo, met all these guys, unbeknownst to me, I would have be mo- I would be moving to New Orleans just a few years later. Mm-hmm. And that's how we all met. And I remember moving to New Orleans five, six years ago or something and bumping into Ricardo. From that gig. <laughs> you live here? What? You know. Uh, so uh, ult- ultimately, um, it led, led you t- uh, to it New went, Orleans. Right. Um, and Ricardo, uh, at FSU, there's a, a good bit of New Orleans influence in that program. Indeed, indeed. The head of that program is Leon Anderson, who lived here for, I think, 15 years or so. Yeah, yeah. I think he's from Shreveport. Shreveport, yeah. Yeah, but uh, he was here for like 15, 20 years. Played with Played with Ellis, Ellis, Marcellus, you know, played with um, Mitchell Player, I learned last night, you know. And, uh, yeah, and uh, he definitely was an – and, you know, FSU was – five and a half, six hours away by car, you know. So it was a pretty easy – it wasn't just that, but it was – he was one of the big influences of, hey, this is Mecca of music six hours that way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's what – therefore, there are a lot of FSU people here. Yeah. Uh, to Jameson Ross, as you mentioned earlier. Right. Yeah, and uh, I'll, Josh Startman of Have a yeah. Great Day. You know, yeah, yeah. it's, a, it's yeah. a lot. <laughs> There's a Tallahassee mafia here. There is, there is. There was a, a consternation about that sure. for a little, for a little while. Another, it would be another one of you guys. That would that would be. Well, I have to say this: I haven't <laughs> met one yet who wasn't a really solid player. In the, <laughs> you know, uh, up, out of that program, you know. Yeah, it's uh, the other big influence for, in terms of the New Orleans connection is uh, Marcus Roberts, right. who I mentioned earlier, and his drummer is Jason Marcellus. And of course, right. he's from New and Orleans. And Roland Garen was his bass player. And Roland Garen was his bass player for some oh, fifteen man. odd years, you know. Right. And he also lives here. So that, that I learned between Leon and Marcus Roberts, I learned a ton of New Orleans music uh, before even stepping foot here, you know. Yeah. So there was like a priming, if you will, for New Orleans. Yeah. When you uh, begin to spend some time here, did you? Sp- get to sit in uh, on occasion and yes. find, find some folks you could play oh, with? Oh, yeah. The first time I came here was like 2010 to hear Sonny Rollins play at Jazz Fest. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. man, what a great set that oh, was. I'll never gosh. forget that <laughs> Oh, they had the whole audience up dancing. Oh, you know, this man and shouting. is like <laughs> 75 years old and has more energy than everybody else. Yeah. He's just, you know, <laughs> is doing like a, a calypso kind of yeah, that uh, Caribbean thing. Caribbean kind of tw- thing. About a 20 minute. And the sound was massive, and the language and the history was just yeah. all there on stage. And so that was oh, just man. amazing. Yeah. And funny enough, I got to meet his drummer and play with his drummer recently with Ryan. Oh, really? In North Carolina. You oh, know. Good. Um, oh, yeah. It yeah. Kobe. Yeah, Kobe. Yeah. yeah. So, th- and then the second time I came here was to hear Wayne Shorter at Jazz Fest. Yeah. And that was just like a, it's like the other side, you know, the history right. and everything, but like also. Very like pushing the envelope, envelope with that quartet, right? And um, you know, I came here, sat in, and I was getting the vibes here for sure. You know, New Orleans has a certain energy oh, yeah. that you know, if it resonates with you, it treats you so well. And yeah. so, I moved here eventually in 2014 uh, to start grad school at University of New Orleans, and um, and, and then went on and got your master's degree. Exactly there, there, yeah. Uh, and you two fellows actually met. Outside of New Orleans, uh, before uh, after the gig in Europe, mm-hmm. on another gig, that when you kind of ha- got this duo idea. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> it's, it's like layers to this, like onion. Right, there is. Uh, no extra charge for the memories. Real yeah. quick, yeah, thank you. Thank to add to the, my, my New Orleans connection, when I was in North Carolina, Bramford had put together a trad band for all us North Carolinian students that, uh, you know, to to learn learn North Carolina Central students. Who we're up there just playing. All we knew to play was bebop, and and you know, every extension that we could think of, we would add to our all our music all the time. All right. It was a lot. And Bramper said, "Man, can you guys just play six chords?" For those of you who don't know, that's just like yeah, some something simple, you know, but actually exceedingly challenging because you're dealing with a limited amount of of options. And also, and also, you're coming from it, it, uh, most jazz schools start you off at Charlie Parker and bebop, you know. And never and go backwards. And they don't go backwards. Right. So you're very unequipped so, yes. to deal with the rhythm and just triadic kind of playing. And that's what it was. So we put together a group of six of us. I remember being in rehearsal at his house, and he looks at the drummer, and he goes, well, I'm going to change my language for this, but he just goes, press rolls, followed by some 
some other choice words. Yeah. Press rolls, Qu crisp queen press rolls, because the drummer's just sitting there, yeah, yeah. you know. <laughs> so. And then I'm playing all these, these, you know. It's <laughs> 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 not that. So we did a bunch of gigs. We went to Puerto Rico. We yeah. went to, we might have gone to Canada. I don't know. We, we went all over to this trad band, and man, that really taught me all this stuff. So I came here wow. already knowing Basin Street Blues and South Rampart Street Parade right. and Perdido right. and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, so but then we we met. We were doing a gig in in D.C. with a trad band, funny, kind of, kind of, sort of. And uh, they needed a I forget how it happened. They needed a spot at the Hamilton Theater in D.C. And uh, so we said they either asked us or we offered. We said we, we'll, we'll play some duo stuff because we've been wanting to do that. Well, I think they had some kind of slot before our main big show, right? And so the manager su suggested, hey, maybe y'all could put something together. And so. it, it went just swimmingly. <laughs> it we were like, great. hey, this is a band. This is yep. two of us. <laughs> and that's how this started. Yeah. Well, I'm, gl I'm glad that, that happened. Um, but then we didn't play for like the longest time. But like you've been years. able to put it back together. Yeah, but recently, yeah. like recently. This, this year, we were able to put it back together. Yeah. And I, I've caught you twice at uh, Snug, I think, two uh, yeah. different, two different shows. One two shows. monk show and, um, and then uh, another mm -hmm. opportunity. Yep. Yeah. We put a put a lot of time into this music. It's kind of nice because now like we can just get up and, and do these gigs. But it took a lot of hours and some painful you know, dark uh, moments and tears, <laughs> what literal <time>? tears <laughs> from laughter. That is like. yeah, right. right. Yeah. What what Branford was was telling you guys reminds me of something George Duke told me mm. when he first got in the uh, Mothers Band with um, uh, uh, Mothers of Invention, Frank Zappa. They were playing some uh, early 50s rock and roll tune, and he was doing what you're talking about. You know, he's after a couple of times through, he starts extending the harmonies. And yeah. Zappa start, stops the rehearsal immediately and says, Triads, George, triads. You got right. something against triads? Right. <laughs> Marcus Robertson talked about that one time, oh, but the yes. power of a triad, how <laughs> unbelievably powerful a triad yeah. can be. And, it, know. It, the point being that uh, even simple music, has a, a relevance and, and strength oh. and power if, if you play it properly. The thing about New Orleans music that's so uh, unique, and it really shouldn't be unique, but it is, is how tied to the melody it is. Yeah. In a lot of, like, the, in what we call the Great American Songbook, um, with a lot of these standards, a lot of the, the songs are written around the harmony, around the chords, and that doesn't really lend itself to a song because you're kind of tied down to the chords. Right. And when you think about how no one sings chords, no one, you know... We don't whistle harmony, but we do whistle songs and melody. In New Orleans, the song comes first, and the harmony is subservient to the melody. Like you look, look at all these James Black tunes, Alvin Batiste, Harold Batiste, Ellis, all these amazing melodies that were written, and they're very hard to play over because the chord changes uh, are not what we're used to. It's not like the stuff coming out of the real book because it's following the melody, and that's the whole thing that I had to learn when I was younger, and all of us. You know, my friends that I went to school with was how to actually deal with melody because in the grand scheme of things in jazz we're not doing that anymore but that's yeah. another subject yeah, that's a whole other subject yeah. <laughs> it's well, uh, and sometimes simple yeah. Yeah. is still difficult right. you know like you could have something that's complex but easy but it can be simple and difficult and New Orleans music it goes in that category not, so a lot of it is complex but a, a lot of it has you know especially the traditional stuff it's more there's a simplicity there's an innocence almost to it mm. but it's actually not easy to play no. at all it yeah. yeah it's kind of like uh, if you think Jelly Roll Morton's music is easy put a chart on the on the band's on the uh, music stand yeah. and, and all right, have play at this. it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or put that wood block on the floor that he's tapping the whole day and these little, all these little things they did man yeah. it's just like yeah. that adds to the music and the rhythm and it's exceptionally difficult mm -hmm. yeah and uh, one thing I always thought, uh, kind of how I expressed uh, that notion, was New Orleans musicians were not afla afraid to play pretty. You know, they would they play a beautiful melody and sell it. You know. Yeah, uh, and again, it's, it's, a it's maybe the toughest thing to do, yeah. really, as a vocalist or an instrumentalist, mm -hmm. is just yeah. just sell that melody. Yeah, and so many times we w we want to kind of diverge from from the chorus and, and jazz, and it, it really, you know. It's a, we're playing a song, and that's what we often forget is we're playing a song that has a nice melody that's written to it. Why are we trying to change things completely? You know, the, it's the musicians in New Orleans that stick to these melodies, and that's what resonates with people because we all know the melodies. We don't know these 
you know, the crazy souls that right. we're coming up with. <laughs> I mean, that's why people want to hear New Orleans music all around the world, you know. I didn't really start touring. I toured a little bit with Marcus, but it was when I moved here when it really started happening, you know. Right. Yeah. People want to hear this music, you know. And, and when you experience it in the hands of really uh, players who know how to play it, there's nothing more spiritually uplifting no. than that music. Man. It yeah. just makes you, takes you to a better place. No, when you listen to something like Kevin Lewis is one of my favorite yeah. trumpet players oh, around yeah. here. I mean, yeah. you listen to someone like him, and it's just like so honest in the music. And, and his way of dealing with you know, his technical proficiency matches right. his understanding of the music. And, when you get guy, and there's a lot of guys like that in the city. And it's just it's a whole nother thing compared to what's going on in the rest of the world. Yeah, yeah the technique never gets in in the way of the musicality. It's exactly. there. It serves it serves exactly. it serves the music. You always right. people are, want to play, players here play in service of the music more than almost any other place I've ever been. That's yep. it. And uh, That's exactly. and we listeners get the, the reward of that. Speaking of listening, lay a couple more on us, why don't you guys? How many we got time for? We got uh, time for maybe two more right now, a short break of talk, and then maybe a final tune. So three, okay. three I'll tell them. Do we do it? Go there? Oh boy. Oh boy. Or would you do the blues? Oh, yeah. Oh. Thank you. 
Beautiful. Ryan Hensler at the piano. Ricardo Pascal with the tenor sax work. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Ryan, I, I know during the pandemic you did a nice recording with uh, Surreal M.A. Oh, yeah. uh, just you, just me. And uh, I think you started working some with uh, Gabrielle Cavassa. Yeah, well. actually, we did a, we have a project that's in the works right now. Um, it'll be coming out in February. So oh, wonderful. I think that's about all I'm at liberty to say, but stay on the lookout for that. Okay, so, so we'll, yeah. we'll definitely look, look forward to that. Put a lot that. of work into it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, great duos are, uh, the, yeah. they, they're, they're in evidence. It's one of my, my favorite settings to play in, is, yeah. is a duo setting. Yeah. Um, maybe it's because of my ADD, I don't know what I just, <laughs> it gives you the, the possibility to, right. to kind of explore so many different avenues that oftentimes can be harder with the, with the trio or quartet. And the other thing too is like, in order to get into that space, the more people you have, the more time it takes to rehearse and the more right. time you need to be together to yeah. have that understanding one another to get into that space. We yeah. don't always have that, but with a duo, it's very easy to get right. into that area of exploration without a ton of rehearsal because it's just two people. Yeah. You know? And, and it opens up the music. Uh, you, you know, sometimes uh, the more players you got, the, you can't quite hear everything as clearly. But right. in a duo, you have that chance to really hear all the voice. I also, voice. it's also, it, it gives me a chance to really deal with the piano more. I think a lot of pianists today that play in trio, quartet, or, or above, when they have a bass player, it's like post bebop, guys forgot how to, how to actually play the piano without someone helping them out, you know? And I like having that ability to just, I have to do everything. I right. like that, you know. Yeah, yeah, a a, a challenge uh, and a reward for yeah. for the player and for for us listeners. Uh, so a project to look for in February. February, March, I think somewhere it in be there. Out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, maybe right around Carnival uh, Mardi Gras, uh, which is before, the 21st, probably I just think. before then. Yeah, just before Mardi Gras. That's that's what we're anticipating. <laughs> and. Um, what what else are you are you doing? You got regular gigs. You're working. Yeah, these I'm days? with the New Orleans Jazz Orchestra now. Um, so we're there, man. Uh, uh, you know, Adonis took over the orchestra, and he's doing phenomenal work with it. And uh, so we got a whole lot of work, dates coming up. We've been doing a lot of traveling. I got my own group. Um, we won a, uh, a competition in Europe. We got a twenty five thousand dollar prize, and that took us to. We just did a tour last week. Played oh, cool. A, yeah. Duke de Lombard in Paris played a festival in Germany. Played nice. um, what else? Uh, the Netherlands, Belgium, and then came back and finished with Mittens. In yeah, New York. I think Nojo's got a, uh, a show Saturday, right? The Christmas show. Got a show Saturday. Saturday yeah, afternoon so at the market. Between Jasmine. my own trio and quartet with with Gabrielle, she's in. You know, yeah. um, and in the Nojo, this. I'm yeah. busy. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. Uh, and, and Ricardo, I, you're a part of a wonderful quartet, the uh, Saturn, Saturn Quartet. Saturn Quartet, yeah. It's got uh, Synchronicities out, which is a terrific CD. You've got a, one one original on there. Mm -hmm. That's nice. Uh, Aftermath, beautiful mm -hmm. composition. Thank you. Uh, how's, how's uh, you guys working, son? Yeah, we um, we uh, recorded our second album uh, this summer. It's not quite out yet. It's untitled as of now, but that'll be out probably sometime early next year. And uh, we're going to start doing some tours now. You know, it's kind of a very new group of FSU kind of guys. We kind of got together, made this band. And uh, so, yeah, we're going to start doing some touring next year and stuff. So Yeah, that's true. But we have our first album out, Synchronicities. It's on Spotify. Yeah, I, I highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. And w what else are you up to? No, Joe, uh, yeah, you're New still Orleans a part Jazz of it. the same yeah. stuff Ryan was saying. You know, we have the big band, and then we have the small group that we tour a little more with. Right. Um, so that's coming together. And I also play with a uh, vocalist slash pianist, Judith Owen. And, oh, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, she's got a new Come Hither record out. She uh, does. Come, and get, come on and get it. Come on and get it. <laughs> so that, that one's out there. Uh, yeah. We did some tours as well this summer. We hit Duke de Lombard <laughs> as oh, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We always cross paths somehow. You know, know. <laughs> it was meant to be. It was meant to be. <laughs> Kiss me, baby. Kiss me. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, you continue to, uh, 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 I keep uh, enjoying your work with, uh, on record with the New Orleans Jazz Orchestra, mm -hmm. uh, particularly the, um, 
Petit Fleur. Yes. Uh, it's a beautiful soprano. We didn't hear your soprano work today, but yeah. you have a beautiful soprano solo on the, on the title tune. Soprano's the other major instrument I play. It's another saxophone. Yeah. Yeah. Very so, New Orleans instrument. <laughs> yeah, and that that's a very nice uh, combination of surreal and the and the orchestra. It is, it Be is beautifully done record. Yeah. Uh, so lots lots to recommend. Uh, opportunities coming up to hear these guys in other contexts, ladies and gentlemen. Thursday. We got, yeah. Oh, at the Pontchartrain. We're at the Pontchartrain Hotel right, at the Bayou Bar. With Peter Harris, and that with Peter Harris and Pedro Segundo, and then uh, we also this Saturday. Are you on the? Are you you on the Saturday uh, uh, gig with the Nojo Seven? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. we, so we got that too. That'll be at the Jazz Market, open to the public. And that's a seven Christmas concert. That's a, mm -hmm. a nice room there at the Poncha Train too. Oh yeah, Very Poncha nice Train. Room. If y'all don't know about uh, what Peter Harris is doing at the Poncha Train, go check it out. Yeah, every, you gotta check it out. So Peter's what, great. Tuesday, time. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Almost every day. Almost every amazing weekend. music. Yeah, every time. He just great bass player, composer, and he just yeah. gets like people that you'd have to spend, you'd have to spend seventy five hundred dollars a ticket in New York to go see these guys that he's right. getting there. And this. Just uh, right there. It's right there. Yeah, yep. beautiful, beautiful, beautiful part of the city to be in. Yeah, for sure. And uh, we got time for one more from you guys. What do you got for us? Okay. You got Close out with some uh, New Orleans, you know, because we've talked about New Orleans a lot. <laughs> we, yeah. We've played some New Orleans tunes, but this one is by Louis Armstrong. It's entitled Weatherbird Rag. All right. Is it by Louis Armstrong? I think, yeah, yeah. Weatherbird Blues? I think it is. No, no, no this is Weatherbird. Oh, this, that's actually just weather. <laughs> right. uh, Earl Hines, I think, was, was on keys on this yeah, one. Earl right. Hines. Thank you. 
Weatherbird. That is Ricardo Pascal at the tenor sax, ladies and gentlemen. Ryan Hansler at the 88s. Wonderful, wonderful afternoon of music and talk from these two very gifted artists. Thank you guys for having us. Thank there you, Fred. New Orleans. Thank you very now, much, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you all for being with us uh, today. If you'd like to see any of this again, uh, these. Sessions are archived on the uh, New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park and the New Orleans Jazz Museum's uh, respective Facebook pages and also YouTube channels. So you can share this uh, session with other folks if you like or check ones out that, uh, that you can't make here in person on the web. We should have very soon uh, the 2023 season schedule announced and we look forward to seeing you back for some of those. Thanks for being with us today.